Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Glad to be in the Word of God once again, as always. There is nothing in the world like spending time with God Almighty in His Word. And if you're a Christian, I know you agree. The Word of God blesses us. So we will begin today where we left off last time, and that will be John chapter 14. We left off in verse 2, so we'll pick it up right about there. Get your Bible, open it up to John chapter 14. The Scripture Verse by Verse website, place where you can study the Word of God, just like we're going to do today, in the same way, verse by verse, listening to me, Teach it one verse at a time using my audio Bible messages. And uh, it's totally under your control at thebibleversebyverse.com because all you have to do is click on the series. There's three complete series going through the Bible. Click on the series dating back over 30 years. Click on the book. Click on the chapter and the section and listen. And we'll study God's word together. And you'll be blessed, guaranteed, guaranteed good time, because it is God's word. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, let's begin reading in John chapter 14, verse 1, where Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. I pointed it out several times in our study of John. Those who say that Jesus never claimed to be God are out of their everlasting, lying, deceived minds. He continually claims to be God in this gospel. Only those with a with a built-in prejudice against him being God, would deny it. You believe in God, believe also in me. He just equated himself with Almighty God. Nobody is equal to God except God. Believe in God, believe in me. That's quite a statement, isn't it? And he goes on, he goes on to say, In my Father's house are many mansions. And mansions actually mean, means uh, abiding places. doesn't necessarily mean a castle. Maybe more like a, an apartment or a townhouse. Anyway, you're going to have one if you're a Christian. God's got one for you. Can't wait to see that thing. It's going to be pretty nice. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so... I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus doesn't keep secrets from his people. He doesn't tell us something that isn't true. He said, if it wasn't so, I, I, I would tell you. You're going to have a mansion. You're going to have a nice place to live. The second you die, you go to your new home. And the neat thing is, you don't have to rent a U-Haul. You don't have to pay a moving company. You, you just come as you are. And everything is supplied. Everything is provided. So he says, I go to prepare a place for you. You're getting it all set. So that when you're dead, when you die, when you breathe your last, everything will be ready for you to move in. Three. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. You know, the apostles really did not want to be separated from Jesus. Not at all. They loved to be around him. And here he says, it's not going to be forever. Yeah, we'll be separated, but it's not going to be forever. Just a while. He says, I'll come back, and then I'll take you to be with me. You see, I can't wait for the end of the age when that happens. Well, it'll happen in the end of the age for people 
who remain alive when Jesus returns. But it happens every single time a Christian passes away. Every time a Christian dies, it happens. And I think many things are going to make eternity a wonderful place to be. But the most important thing is that Jesus will be there with us in person. My dream will come true because I, I've always thought it would have been great to be an apostle and to be with Jesus night and day just to listen to him talk and watch how he lived. And that would have been tremendous. My dream is going to come true. And yours will too if you love Jesus. You'll be able to be with him. We'll be able to ask him questions and learn from God in person. And that'll be good. Because, you know, I, I get questions, Bible questions. A lot of times I don't have the answer on the tip of my tongue. I have to do research. That's one reason I like questions. It makes me dig in. If I don't know the answer, I have to dig in. Well, on that day, I'll just say, hey, Jesus, what's the answer to this Bible question? <clears throat> they probably will skip me and just go right to Jesus himself, but that's okay. Verse 4, And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? <clears throat> it is good to be around people like Thomas who have doubts but are also eager to learn, and so they ask questions. They don't pretend that they know everything. They don't pretend that they're satisfied with what they do know. They want to know more. They have doubts, and they ask questions to clarify those doubts. It's good to be around people like that. I like people like that. I have no problem whatsoever with Thomas. I know he's got the label doubting Thomas, fine, but he's not quitting Thomas. He may have been doubting Thomas, but he wasn't quitting Thomas. He persevered with Christ in spite of all of his doubts. And what he didn't know, he asked questions. And Thomas asks a, a very good question, question here in verse 5. And you know, what, you, know, you know what's good about that? We all get to learn. That's another reason I like the Q&A program that I have been doing. And I would continue to do it, and I do do it whenever I get a question sent in to me. Um, but one of the reasons I've always liked question and answers is because if you've thought of a question, chances are there are many others who have thought of the question too, but just never asked it. So you'll be helping to answer their question by asking a question. And we all get to learn from Thomas's question right here, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But by me. Someone says, well, I didn't think Christ was so narrow-minded. No one comes to the Father except through me? Well, Jesus said he was the truth. He was truth. He is truth. And he spoke truth. And genuine truth is always narrow and inflexible. If it isn't, it's a guess. It's a hypothesis. It's a theory. And it's not truth. Truth is narrow. Truth is inflexible. Truth is what it is. The truth is, if you pick up a brick and you throw it through my windshield, it will break. That's the truth. There's no wiggle room there. And I am inflexible, and I am dogmatic about the fact that a brick is going to shatter my windshield. I won't budge on that. It's the truth. And that is the nature of truth. Jesus is the one way to heaven. 
And Jesus being one way to heaven, the only way to heaven, is inflexible. No wiggle room, no exceptions. It is truth. It is narrow. It is inflexible. It is truth. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Seven, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Look at verse 8 too. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. I like, I like Philip too. I like all these guys, except Judas. But I like Philip. Nothing shallow about Philip's goal in life. What's his goal? I want to see the Father. That's a pretty good goal. That's pretty lofty. I want to see the Father. I suppose there are a lot of goals that people have. Wealth, education, position. They can be fine. As long as they don't become idols. And as goals, they are mustard seeds. They are absolutely nothing compared to the goal of really knowing God. That's a good goal. That's something that should be number one on our list. Verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Philip doesn't need to get to know the Father. Philip needs to know that he already knows the Father. He doesn't know it, but he knows the Father. He knows Jesus, and that's the same as knowing the Father. They are one. Jesus is Almighty God in a human body. The Father is Almighty God without a human body, but they're one and the same. Verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Jesus' words never contradicted his actions. And that is because both of his words, I should say both his words and his actions, were controlled by the Father. That's why there was perfect synchronization between the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus' words and Jesus' actions. They were all controlled by Almighty God. Everything is in sync. And that's why Christians get along with each other when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. The problem of strife within the body of Christ is solved when all members are submitted totally to the leading of the Holy Spirit and guided completely by the written word of God. When everybody is under the control of God and being led by God, then there's not going to be any division because they are grounded in truth and led by truth. Verse 11, <clears throat> Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. In other words, if my words are not enough to convince you that the Father's in me and I'm in the Father and we're one in the same, if my words, me telling you that is not enough, then believe my actions. You can believe that. They certainly testify to it being a fact. If there is, and of course there is, an all-powerful, all-loving, all-wise, all-holy God, you would expect him to speak like Jesus and act like Jesus. 
Verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Christians will do greater things than Jesus. You say, wait just a minute. Now I know this is wrong. Now I know there's errors in the Bible. Jesus would, we will do greater things. We Christians do greater things than Jesus? Well, that's what he said. Say, I don't believe it. Well, look at the evidence. Greater by God's definition of what greatness is. Keep that in mind, first and foremost. And then remember that Peter preached one sermon, the first sermon ever preached in the, in the church age on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 souls were saved from hell. 3,000 souls were saved from hell. That's greater than any miracle that Jesus did while he was here. And he did some dandies. But none of them were more important than the miracle that Peter was a part of when he preached the pure word of God without watering it down and the Holy Spirit worked through him to save 3,000 souls from hell fire. That's a greater work. It's greater to save souls than to give sight to the blind. It's greater to save souls than to heal paralytics or even raise the dead. It's the, saving souls is the greatest thing that anybody can see happen. It's the greatest miracle of all. And with the Word of God at our disposal and the Spirit of God, we can see greater miracles than the ones that Jesus did while he was here. As long as you're not afraid and intimidated into watering down the God's Word. God's word. Because if you are, then you're not going to see anything. You're going to be shooting blanks. You're going to be a firework that's a dud. Light the fuse and dead. Open up the Word of God. Preach a watered-down message. Leave out anything that's controversial that might rub somebody the wrong way, even though it's crystal clear in the Bible. Don't say it. Pass over it. Laugh at it. Scoff at it. Giggle, giggle. Snicker, snicker. And you've just drained the Word of God of its power. And you've become a disgrace in the process. 13. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. When we pray for something that is in line with the Word of God and consistent with Christ's character, we are praying in Jesus' name. And we will get what we pray for when God decides that the time is right. That's what that means to pray in Jesus' name. Praying in Jesus' name does not mean you just simply add on, tag on to the end of your prayer. In Jesus' name, there I'm going to get it. No, no, no. When, you, when a policeman says stop in the name of the law, he's appealing to a higher authority than himself. He's appealing to the law that says this is right and this is wrong and this gives me the power to arrest you. That's what it means to stop in the name of the law. So when you pray in the name of Jesus, you are praying for something that is consistent with Jesus' character and consistent with what is written in his word. That's praying in Jesus' name. It's not tacking on the words to the end of your prayer. 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Don't do, don't do someone this disservice. Don't tell someone you love them and continue to do things that you know that they don't like. And I'm talking about purposely. 
Don't tell someone you love them, mister. Don't tell your wife you love her if you consistently cheat on her. That's mockery. No wonder she's so angry. No wonder she took that, those flowers that you bought her to try to reconcile. No wonder she took those flowers and threw them in your face. Because you'll be right out again tonight down at the bar getting drunk and picking up girls. Don't tell someone you love them and then, do, and then purposely continue to do what is absolutely abhorrent to them. That's not love. That's mockery. And don't tell God that you love him. But continue to sin because that's mockery as well. We show our love to God. By our obedience. Love isn't worth a nickel if there aren't actions to back it up. It's not worth a nickel. And saying, I love God, I love you, God, isn't worth a nickel unless it's backed up with obedience because Jesus said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Or you don't. Love is never measured by words or by feelings. Love is measured by actions. That's what determines whether it's real or not. If your husband treats you like dirt, he doesn't love you. If your wife treats you like dirt, she doesn't love you. I'm talking about not, I'm not talking about an, an occasional mistake. Because we all offend one, one another. I'm talking about a settled lifestyle, a conviction. 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. The comforter is a reference to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit stays with Christians forever. You know what I like about Jesus? He did not kick his men out of the group if they sinned. He was grieved when they sinned, but he put up with it. And now, the presence of the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Jesus, has replaced the presence of Jesus in the world. When he ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit, 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, into the world to, among other things, indwell people the second that they receive Christ. The Spirit of Jesus is in every Christian, and the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, has taken the place of Jesus in this world. And like Christ, the Holy Spirit is grieved when we as Christians sin. He's grieved when we, when we sin, but he does not leave when we sin. 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. One of the uh, unique things about the church age is that the Holy Spirit actually lives inside of God's people. Yes, take that literally. He literally lives inside God of his people. That was not the case before the day of Pentecost, before the church age. In the past, in Old Testament days, he had been with God's people and even came upon God's people to empower them for service. But these days, he is in Christians. And according to Jesus, he's in us for good. 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Jesus, though not present with his people physically, since he ascended to heaven, has not left us alone. We have Jesus' literal spirit inside of us. You know what that means? We have his mind, we have his emotions, we have his will inside of us. You have a mind, you have an emotion, emotions, you have a will, 
That's, that's, what, that's what gives you personhood. And the person of the Holy Spirit, who is a person, lives inside of you if you're a Christian. So you not only have your own mind, emotions, and will, but you have God's mind, emotion, and will as well. And really, when you stop and think about it, I, I mean, I know I've said I'd love to have been around and lived and walked with Jesus, but the setup we got right now is better than what the apostles had, really. In some ways. 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. That is a fantastic word from Jesus. Because ye live, because I live, ye will live also. You know what that means? That means that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty's pledge to raise us Christians from the dead as well. That is what Jesus meant when he said, because I live you will live also. Verse 20. At that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. You will know that I am in my Father, Jesus said, and ye are in me, and I am in you. You will know that. You will know that. And what is the clue that tells a person that Jesus is in them? What is the clue? How do you know? Well, for starters, there's a change in a person's thinking when they truly receive Christ as Lord and Savior and they get saved. There's a change in their thinking. They don't laugh at the crude jokes anymore. They don't think getting drunk is fun anymore. They don't like to hear the name of the Lord our God taken in vain anymore. These things never used to be a problem. But you receive Christ and all of a sudden, that's it just makes your skin crawl. What happened? Jesus has moved inside. That's what's happened. You know that Jesus is in you when your attitude towards sin is one of true disgust, which is the same as Jesus. Then you know. His mind, his emotions, his will, his person is in you. You can, you can tell. He's loud and clear about his feelings. And it spills right over into you, into your soul. That's how you know. The mind of Christ. The Bible says you have the mind of Christ if you're a Christian. Jesus' thoughts are ever with you. That's why you feel guilty when you sin. That's why you're not happy when you sin. And there you have it. Well, I'm going to stop right there. We'll pick it up in verse 21 next time. In the meantime, I hope you're still hungry for more of God's Word, because if you are, you know where you can go. The Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study until, you, until your eyes are so heavy that you can't see anymore. You start getting blurry, blurred vision. Study and fill yourself with God's Word until you can't take it anymore. Take a rest and then get right back in it. That's my recommendation. Study as much as you can from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages. And if you haven't gone through the whole Bible with me online, do it. Do it. I recommend that wholeheartedly. Study from Genesis through Revelation, all 31,000 plus verses in the English Bible at thebibleversebyverse.com. And remember, I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. This has always been a faith ministry, which means I give out the Word of God as straight, as clear, as concise as I possibly can and trust that God will use it and move the hearts of his people who truly love his word to pray for me, pray for the word, and click the donate button at the top of the front page. 
and prayerfully give. Until next time, so long.